Pastor A.J. Espinosa. We're reading the entire Bible together, chapter by chapter, out loud. And we're looking here at the book of Exodus, looking at Exodus chapter 4 today. Uh, last time, Exodus chapter 3, we were just talking about that. Such a cool chapter. The, the name of God revealed. We figure out what the meaning of the name of God is. Um, it's just a, a very key chapter, lays out everything that's going on in the book. And then today, Exodus chapter 4, the action begins. Moses goes back to Egypt, and he actually, we, we get ready for this this confrontation here. So uh, th this is kind of where like the whole rest of the story kind of picks up and really starts moving on. Uh, really, really cool chapter. We the thing that you see in the title is uh, Moses is given these powerful signs. So these are the signs that happened before the signs of you know the big plagues that we always think of. There were some other ones too. So uh, really cool things getting set up here in this chapter. Joining us today, we have as our guest we've got Pastor William Swirla, pastor at Holy Trinity Lutheran Church in Hacienda Heights, California. Uh, good morning, brother. I know we were having some we were having some trouble <laughs> earlier, but can you hear me now? <laughs> I can hear you. Can you hear me? Hey, fantastic! You can. Uh, you can hear good. me. Yeah, I can. I certainly can. And it's, <laughs> and it's a delight to hear you. It's been a little while, it's brother. Kind of a, kind of amazing, actually. I, uh, anyway, I think we just left out the middleman and we're just talking directly, and that's really the way to go here. So. <laughs> <laughs> Exodus yeah, well, four, I mean, huh? well, speak, speaking, speaking, speaking of middlemen, well, I mean, uh, that's that that's kind of the name of the game here, right? So it is. Moses is the the intermediary. It is very much so, and you know, I think whenever, yeah, obviously, when when uh, we from the uh, other side of the cross read the Torah, we're always we're always on the alert for Christ, right? You know, and and so Moses is the the uh, preeminent Christ figure, though there are other little sort of things in play that uh, uh, indicate Christ's person and work, but Moses is the covenant mediator, the one who stands between God and the people uh, in a very unique sort of way. Uh, and in his own kind of history, too, as you read through the Torah, you know, Moses uh, bears that kind of scandal of the cross in his own career. He's constantly rejected by his own people, uh, you know, people <laughs> want to go back to Egypt. They reject his leadership. Uh, you know, all these things that kind of bespeak of, you know, he came to his own and his own did not receive him uh, of Christ. So, so we're always kind of on the alert for the Christ uh, imagery that comes through this. Uh, certainly. And uh, yeah, both the, both the similarities and the, the contrasts, as we saw in the last couple chapters, too. Well, uh, yeah, let, without any further ado, well, a little bit shorter on time today, so let's go ahead and turn to the text. As we do so, would you, brother, open us up with a prayer? Gracious God, our Father in heaven, we thank you for um, your making a people, people Israel. We thank you. We thank you for uh, bringing, raising up Moses to be the deliverer of your people and thereby showing uh, through the history of Israel our redemption in Christ, that uh, you have raised up that one final covenant leader, that mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. So we pray your blessing upon our uh, reading of the history of Moses and Israel. We pray that you would open our minds, hearts, uh, and ears, that we may hear, hear your word rightly comprehended and truly believe it for the sake of your son, Jesus, our Savior. Amen. 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 Thank you, brother. All right. Well, so we, uh, we we kind of already talked a little bit about some of the themes here we're going to look at. I want to read the whole thing straight through before we go and turn into the details, but anything that we should be listening out for, anything else, um, you know, maybe key themes or recurring ideas um, as we listen to the whole thing as a unit? Well, I think in this chapter, uh, you get perhaps uh, you get a little bit of a foretaste of the plagues. Uh, you know, right. God is authenticating Moses' call uh, because there's going to be a question when Moses comes to the people and says, I'm your man. And they say, who sent you? <laughs> right. <laughs> Which is always the question, isn't it? You know, when, when one dares to speak with the authority of God's word, when, when one dares to say, God sent me, uh, I think that's a reasonable question is, uh, yeah, right, you know, show us. And so mm -hmm. God mm -hmm. does give some signs to authenticate 
uh, Moses' call. And the signs kind of prefigure the uh, plagues that are going to come on Egypt uh, as part of God's judgment on on Egypt. So you, you have that. You also have um, Moses' reluctance. I, I, I love Moses' reluctance. I think Luther said, Mo, Moses said, uh, 10 different excuses not to do this. <laughs> yeah. And each time God addresses it, you know, he's basically, I'm not a good mm-hmm. speaker, you know. So so you have you have all these things going on. Um, and yet, yet God has a purpose. God has a plan. Moses is his man, whether Moses thinks so or not. And, uh, and, and God uh, manifests that call, the authority of Moses, with signs and wonders so that the people would trust him and follow him. Yeah, exactly. And, and I think that in, in that way, it's really a, a pretty good continuation of the previous chapter with all of this. Um, I mean, because he starts in the previous chapter with his excuses and objections and insecurities. Uh, but but yeah, we do, like you were saying, there is a transition to getting us ready for those plagues. So uh, we'll, we'll hear this transition in this chapter here as we read it. Let's go ahead then and turn to the text. We're looking at Exodus chapter 4 here in the English Standard Version here from the top. Then Moses answered, But behold, they will not believe me or listen to my voice, for they will say, The Lord did not appear to you. The Lord said to him, What is it that what is that in your hand? He said, A staff. And he said, Throw it on the ground. So he threw it on the ground, and it became a serpent, and Moses ran from it. But the Lord said to Moses, Put out your hand and catch it by the tail. So he put out his hand and caught it, and it became a staff in his hand, that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. Again, the Lord said to him, put your hand inside your cloak. And he put his hand inside his cloak, and when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous like snow. Then God said, put your hand back inside your cloak. So he put his hand back inside his cloak, and when he took it out, behold, it was restored like the rest of his flesh. If they will not believe you, God said, or listen to the first sign, they may believe the latter sign. If they will not believe even these two signs or listen to your voice, you shall take some water from the Nile and pour it on the dry ground, and the water that you shall take from the Nile will become blood on dry ground. But Moses said to the Lord, O my Lord, I am not eloquent, either in the past or since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and of tongue. Then the Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth, or who makes him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall speak. But he said, Oh, my Lord, please send someone else. Then the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, Is there not Aaron, your brother, the Levite? I know that he can speak well. Behold, he is coming out to meet you, and when he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. You shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth, and I will be with your mouth and with his mouth, and will teach you both what to do. He shall speak for you to the people, and he shall be your mouth, and you shall be as God to him. And take in your hand the staff, with which you shall do the signs. Moses went back to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said to him, Please let me go back to my brothers in Egypt to see whether they are still alive. And Jethro said to Moses, Go in peace. And the Lord said to Moses in Midian, Go back to Egypt, for all the men who were seeking your life are dead. So Moses took his wife and his sons and had them ride on a donkey and went back to the land of Egypt. And Moses took the staff of God in his hand. And the Lord said to Moses, When you go back to Egypt, see that you do before Pharaoh all the miracles that I have put in your power. But I will harden his heart, so that he will not let the people go. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son. And I say to you, Let my son go, that he may serve me. If you refuse to let him go, behold, I will will kill your firstborn son. At a lodging place on the way, the Lord met him and sought to put him to death. Then Zipporah took a flint and cut off her son's foreskin and touched Moses' feet with it and said, Surely you are a bridegroom of blood to me. So he let him alone. 
it was then that she said, a bridegroom of blood because of the circumcision. The Lord said to Aaron, go into the wilderness to meet Moses. So he went and met him at the mountain of God and kissed him. And Moses told Aaron all the words of the Lord with which he had sent him to speak and all the signs that he had commanded him to do. Then Moses and Aaron went and gathered together all the elders of the people of Israel. Aaron spoke all the words that the Lord had spoken to Moses and did the signs in the sight of the people, and the people believed. And when they heard that the Lord had visited the people of Israel and that he had seen their affliction, they bowed their heads and worshipped. There you go. So, a, a lot, yeah, a lot of, a lot of, well, there you go. A lot of action um, compared to everything, I mean, so far, right? I mean, it's, it's very quick. It's, uh, it's got a good combination. There's a lot of speech. I mean, you have the back and forth um, with God and Moses, but I mean, it's just the, the scenes move. And, and of course, uh, we'll have to talk about there's the scene right in the middle that people just aren't sure what to do with. But I mean, just a lot gets moving really fast. Yeah, you have, um, I mean, the bulk of this chapter is the reluctance of Moses and his excuses to the point where, where the the anger of God is kindled against Moses and, and he kind of loses patience with him. Uh, this is kind of a problem when you are, you know, the <laughs> the elect mediator, you know, <laughs> you're always on the hot seat. Um, you know, Moses got in trouble in the Exodus too. You recall? I mean, finally to the point where he right. he doesn't he doesn't gain access to the Promised Land. He's he's buried in the wilderness. You know, so uh, it's it's a dangerous business. Um, the other thing that we'll have to talk about this little this incident at uh, verse twenty four uh, with Zipporah, and uh, th- that is that is a strange little kind of drop in. Um, because it, it, yeah, it's but, like... but, it, but it fits the theme you were just describing, though, of, of Moses being in trouble <laughs> or, yeah. or Moses not being in a good position. Right. I mean, I mean, and that's kind of been the thing that we've seen. Uh, I mean, since chapter two, even right. That it's just Moses himself is kind of problematic and inadequate. I mean, for everything is as big as he's going to become in, in the uh, in the minds of the people of Israel. Right. And this is going to be the, the books of Moses. Right. I mean, these chapters really kind of are they hold together on that theme yeah it really cuts moses down to size you're you're not you're not as great as he was as as significant a figure as he is in the history of old testament israel yet you're not going to uh deify him there's just no Mm -hmm. way you're going to you know it's going to keep it's really going to cut him down to size as a servant of the lord but a flawed servant of the lord much the way that you know the apostle paul was or any of the apostles the mm-hmm. the gospels do the same thing with the disciples they don't allow yep. you to make these legendary heroes out of them because it it shows these deep deep flaws uh of of character these lapses in faith uh, all kinds of things going on of course we can identify with that individually because we're in the same boat but uh, it really prevents Moses from being deified. And I mean, there's certain things about him that you could come really close. Like, you know, he glowed when he come, came off the mountain. Uh, th- yeah. This, this kind of can really get to the point of the deification of man if you're not careful. And I think that the Torah is very, very, uh, uh, it's as honest about Moses as the Gospels are about the disciples. I think that's well said, and it's one of the other things. I, I mean, as I was going through this, I was just struck by how it, it feels so much like the Gospels when you read this story. Of course, there's a lot of phrases that seem to be alluded to, actually, even in the Gospels. I'm thinking particularly of Matthew. Um, I mean, we just read Mark, but I mean, of course, I mean, but the flight to Egypt, just, I mean, all this language, um, it seems like so much. But yeah, comparing, you know, the way that the uh, you know, the disciples are, are cut down to size, like you were saying, especially like Peter. Um, but then, you know, another thing that I thought was, which is kind of interesting, was that just, um, I, I mean, like even the bit at the end, like, you know, they hear and they believe that that kind of feels like at the, uh, you know, at the end of the uh, wedding at Cana, right? Um, th- there's just like all these little phrases here and there that just, it, it very much just it feels like the New Testament kind of is going on. Like it's it's very much kind of part of the same um, kind of style, the same, well, maybe the same, even bigger story. Yeah, you know, at, at um, a couple of things, at Exodus 4.22, where God puts words into Moses' mouth, this is what you're going to say uh, you know, in my name, this is the Lord. 
Israel's my firstborn son. And I say, do you let my son go that he may serve me? You know, that's the seed for the Hosea out of Egypt I've called my son, uh, which right. then is the springboard to Matthew's fulfillment in the flight to Egypt and return um, of Jesus when he was a young child. Out of Egypt I've called my son. And so you see Israel as son of God. Uh, and the firstborn of Pharaoh is is the is the the um, kind of the equivalent here. So you know, my firstborn for your firstborn kind of thing. And then um, yep. and then Hosea uh, Hosea springs off of that in terms of the recall of Israel to faithfulness. And uh, then Matthew sees the fulfillment of it. Then in the return of Jesus from Egypt, he's doing the Israel thing. Uh, in in basically hiding for safety in Egypt and then returning out of Egypt. So again, and then finally in fulfillment out of Egypt, I've called my son. So, but it begins here. It begins with this engagement, right? And then I think that's actually for me. I, I think maybe like the the key theme. I mean, it's right there, kind of in the middle of the chapter, even too. This idea of a firstborn son. This is what's going to set up the plagues it's it's what's the logic of the plagues right because that's the final plague that we're eventually going to get to and so like you were saying it's the firstborn for the firstborn and when we get into uh, the rest of the torah and we talk about you know having to buy back the firstborn and, and all of this and then when we go back uh, you know backwards into genesis this so like this whole firstborn theme i mean it's it's so key and i think that that's kind of where we need to see everything going we want to develop this when we get back from our break but we do need to take our break everybody hang on we're looking at exodus chapter four here on thy strong word we'll be right back Ecclesiastes 10 verse 10 states, If the iron is blunt and one does not sharpen the edge, he must use more strength. But wisdom helps one to succeed. Find this true wisdom in Christ on Sharper Iron every weekday morning at 8 a.m. here on Worldwide KFUO. Sharpen the iron of your faith together with two pastors as they take up the sword of the Spirit to proclaim the gifts of Christ crucified and risen for you. Blessing is a condition that's true even if you're not completely conscious of it or even if you don't fully appreciate it. Only God can bless in this sense. And Jesus, sitting in God's spot on the mountain, speaks for God as the Son of God, and he blesses. Dr. Michael Ziegler, this week on The Lutheran Hour. Sundays at 12.30 and 5 p.m. on Worldwide KFUO. Welcome back, everybody, to Thy Strong Word. I'm Pastor A.J. Espinosa. We're looking at Exodus chapter 4 here. We're joined by our guest here returning. We've got Pastor William Swirla, pastor at Holy Trinity Lutheran Church in Hacienda Heights, California. Looking at, you know, it, it's this transition from, you know, the objections of Moses to then the signs and, and this key theme we were looking at here, the, the firstborn son theme, um, a big theme, especially that, that life for a life idea that was set up in Genesis, especially, um, I mean, well, of course, I mean, even with Adam um, and his sons, but then also, as we saw last time, we were making the comparison between Exodus 3 and Abraham and Isaac, right, um, and then going forward then to the Lord Jesus. So, I mean, it's, it's so key, and it's right here in Exodus chapter 4, all getting set up, this firstborn son idea. If you have a question for me or Pastor Swirla, you can join the conversation here. We are doing uh, questions and comments over the internet here. So if you've got a uh, question, you can put it in an email, kfuo at kfuo.org. Already got a couple that we're going to take a look at that just got sent in. Also, you can check out the Facebook stream, facebook.com slash AJ Espinosa. Uh, the stream's right there. And you can just put any comments or questions you have right there in the box. Uh, but yeah, so I want to take a look at some of these uh, questions here. But you know, actually, brother, I wanted to really, really quickly ask you. Um, you know, your your church's uh, name, Holy Trinity. Um, I, you guys must be must be really amped up for this weekend, then. 
<laughs> yeah, well, it's actually it's our first time back together. So, oh, wow. uh, so it's it's going to be uh, it, an amped amped up is not really the word for it. There's a lot of I think apprehension <laughs> and a lot of uh, uh, there's a lot of lot of variables that I haven't quite figured out yet. But uh, this will be yeah. the first time that we've gathered since Lent, since since in March. So uh, yeah. wow. it's going to be uh, going to be kind of kind of interesting. Uh, we live in L.A. County, and L.A. County. Uh, is in the shadow of L.A. City. Uh, you know, we're a county mm-hmm. of 10 million people. We are probably the, one of the hottest uh, places for uh, coronavirus. Uh, and so we, even though um, our neighborhood may not uh, feel the impact quite as strongly, uh, we nevertheless uh, kind of share the real estate with a very large metropolitan city. So it, it, it affects uh, public policy by us, too. So we haven't been able to meet. Uh, we're going to Give it a go this weekend and see how it goes. But I don't see it as a, it's not going to be a triumphal event. I think it's going to be a, a time mm. of uh, sober reflection and repentance and, uh, and you know, considering what it means to be, uh, to live in the life of the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, to be baptized into that name. So there's going to be a lot of, I think, just gratitude for being back. Yeah, well, I mean, God bless your return back. And uh, even if it is a, a somber and more contemplative and uh, cautious gathering, it's, uh, of course, as you were saying, just a blessing to be back and to be uh, celebrating and contemplating these things together. Uh, yeah, you know, and it's interesting, you know, thinking of the Trinity, well, last time I looked at the name of God and, and today even still, again, uh, there is this threefold name. This is something I, d- I didn't mention last time, but every time he says it, you know, God, your father is God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Jacob. I feel like there's something kind of analogous that kind of sets it up really nicely for the New Testament. Uh, God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Holy Spirit. That, I mean, r- I mean, right? I mean, there's, there's the God of your father, so you actually have the word there. There's the firstborn son theme so already the father is identified or god is identified as father um in a sense um and then you got like the, these three patriarchs these three names that are given so i don't know it, it it's uh, of course it's not as if <laughs> that, that may be a know, bit of a this, reach because you know i mean who's <laughs> who's the son of jacob you got 12 of them okay so you know it, it's kind of uh it's it's the the covenant goes from one man to one man until father yeah. jacob and then and then it's distributed to the 12 and and so Jacob's the father of Israel. Um, I do. I, I mean, I, I agree. I, again, that's a post. It's a post cross lens yeah. through which yeah, yeah, we yeah. read uh, the Old Testament. Uh, I, I like to say that the, uh, the the Trinity is is there in the Old Testament, but kind of latently. It's there in a hidden sort yeah. of way. So you have you have Yahweh. You have the Ruach Yahweh, the Spirit of Yahweh. You have the Malach Yahweh, the Messenger or Angel of the Lord, the the Messenger of Yahweh. And they all have the character of God Himself, and and you, but you can't really get a beat on it. You're you're, there really isn't, um, I would say, an explicit doctrine of the Trinity in the Old Testament. In fact, if Jesus hadn't said baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, I'm not sure we'd have a Holy Trinity Sunday. Okay, so or you know, had sure, He not made sure. the big speech in the upper room in John. Uh, we wouldn't have a lot of material to work with in terms of the mystery of the triunity of God. Mm-hmm. But the Old Testament being concrete and being very, um, yeah. I don't know, it, it's, it's there. It, it's there, but it's yeah, yeah, there yeah. only if you know what you're looking for. <laughs> oh, yeah, certainly. No, and I, and I, think, I think that's really that's, that's well said, and I, I totally agree. I, I think what I'm getting at, because I'm thinking about more, uh, especially you know, with the, the traditional recitation and confession of the Athanasian Creed, you know, I'm thinking about kind of a, <laughs> been thinking a lot about meter and cadences um, and, and the, the tempo of worship, you might say. And I feel like this is setting you up with like the, the tempo and the meter of liturgical language for the Trinity, right? Because it's actually yeah. like in Hebrew, right? You go Elohe Av. I mean, it's, it's God, Father, right? So you actually have the two right next to each other and you get a rhythm then of, you know, God, God, this, God, that, and God, the third thing. Uh, so, I mean, it's just kind of interesting how it really just kind of, there's already a Trinitarian tempo, I'll put it that way, if not like, you know, a full-blown doctrine or anything like that. But it's just, you know, when, when that was then later said, I mean, I think that it must have rolled off the tongue when the Lord Jesus said it, because it, he was kind of already using this kind of, um, this kind of template or this kind of uh, meter that was already there in the Old Testament. 
Yeah, the triplet figure is 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 uh, is very common. I think the two liturgical expressions that we're most familiar with would be uh, the song of the cherubim from Isaiah chapter six. The holy, holy, holy uh, is Yahweh Sabaoth. Um, so the the thrice holy, mm-hmm. uh, and yeah. also the the threefold invocation of the covenantal name of God in Numbers with the Aaronic benediction. So you know Yahweh bless and keep you. Yahweh make His face shine upon you and be gracious mm-hmm. to you. Yahweh lift His countenance yep. upon you. So That's the true. threefold invocation again. You know, it's it's not explicitly there, but uh, implicitly, right. yes. And like you say, I, I think that's right. It, it sets you up. One of the best ways to set people up historically is to embed it in liturgy, because liturgy is repetitive. And so you recite these formulas over and over and over again for generations and centuries. And so, uh, you know, the, the, the Song of the Cherubim, I don't know if that was ever sung in Old Testament uh, Israel, certainly became a New Testament hymn. And you hear it in the Revelation repeated. Uh, but certainly the ironic benediction would have been heard by the people repetitively. And and so that rhythm, that threefold rhythm, and yet su- uh, superimposed on that, the Shema of Deuteronomy 6 that declares Yahweh. Uh, I, I well, don't right. go with that numerical that Yahweh is one, but Yahweh, Yahweh alone. There is no other God but Yahweh, you know? And so you have the unity of God and the, the and yet the threefoldness of God. So mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, it's, it's kind right. of there. Yeah, yeah. Now in, in our text in Exodus 4, the, um, and I always look to see what, what's God called, you know, in the, especially it's more important, I think, in the prophets, because sometimes mm-hmm. he's God, Ale. Sometimes he's God, Elohim. Right. Sometimes he's uh, the plethora of other names that God goes by. But um, this is uniquely covenantal. Um, the, the narrator here is, is uh, using the Tetragrammaton, the all capitals, Lord, the, mm-hmm. you know, the, the one that Adonai is the substitute for. But, but it, this, is, this is the covenantal name of God, Yahweh. Right. Uh, and, and the emphasis is this action is covenantal. This is what he swore on his name to Abraham, yep. Isaac, and Jacob. Yeah, no, that's what we were talking about yesterday. That I mean, it, it comes from that promise that he said, you know, I will be with you. It, it means he will be, like you said, covenantal promise uh, language here. And you have that reaffirmed here. Um, it maybe kind of take these two together a little bit quickly so we can, because uh, actually I was looking over the email questions and they're they're all dealing with stuff in the second half of the chapter. So we need to get to the second half of the chapter. <laughs> Clearly, but, people want but, to go uh, there. All right. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah but uh, but uh, but yeah, that's, that's fine. That's good. Thank you for sending in those questions. But but I mean the the kind of covenantal promise uh, language here is here again, where you know he's saying like, but hang on a second, but they're not going to believe me, right? I mean that was the same objection. It's not really like he's come up with really anything new, um, but it's he's saying kind of again, you know, hey. I will be with you. I will teach you. You know, I will uh, be with your mouth. So that that I will be just kind of keeps getting reaffirmed. And so these signs here are just these affirmations that he he will be truly uh, with him. He sees the signs now, and that's how he knows that God will be with him later. See, and I think that's important because at the beginning of Torah— uh, you have these these two two uh, creation accounts, and and in Genesis one, uh, it's Elohim, and so literally gods, uh, you know, and, and this is this right. is the great mystery. This is God in His transcendence, the God who simply speaks, and so it is. Uh, in Genesis two uh, two five, starting, uh, you have Yahweh Elohim. So so. Uh, is added, and it's kind of an anachronism because if you're following the history, uh, that right. name hasn't been revealed yet, but we're not going to parse that. <laughs> um, right. But it, it emphasizes God's imminence, his with us. This is the God who, you know, messes with the mud. This is God who breathes into nostrils. This is the God who walks with us in the cool of the day in a garden. So you have that that paradox of God who is above the heavens, beyond all things, and the God who is right here in our midst uh, with us. And so with Moses and this episode, this is God is with us. He is in Moses' mouth. You know, his word, Moses' words are his right. words. You know, uh, you see the same with Jesus and, and his blessing of the, the, uh, the apostles in the upper room. You know, the, the forgiveness you speak is my forgiveness, you see. And, and so mm-hmm. Jesus, again, you know, his words, his spirit, 
um, they they are speaking not only for him or on his behalf, but those are his words and are to be heard as his words. So so this is that yeah. right thereness of God, that imminence of God, that the, the, the God who is in, with, and under, um, and not simply out there somewhere beyond all things. Right. Well, yeah, and then as you were saying, um, just also highlighting that, I mean, it's such an interesting phrase there. It's in, where was it? It's uh, in verse 12, where it is, uh, yeah, he says, I will be with your mouth. You know, it's, I mean, after having already said with you, it's like, okay, Moses, just in case you thought that that didn't include your mouth, it does, all right? <laughs> yeah, and you're Moses gonna is very, be... con- he's concerned about his <laughs> mouth. I'm very confused. Work. <laughs> I mean, you're going to be with me, but but my mouth is like its own thing. It just says things. You, you don't understand. Like, hey, I've gave, you know, so he says, yeah, I will be with your mouth. And so, the, I mean, the eminence, yeah, I mean, and particularly um, in connection with speech and, and the word. And, you know, of course, you know, Trinity Sunday, we're going to look at Genesis chapter one and that whole idea of um, speaking in the word. So, yeah, I mean, I totally agree with everything you're saying. I think these are the, the some of the big themes that are just running through scripture and here too. Um, but, I, I do want to just maybe ask one more question before we move on to the second half of the chapter. You know, do you think anything in particular of these three signs? You got the two that um, Moses gets to see himself right now. The third he doesn't because he's not at the Nile. Uh, makes sense. Um, but I mean, th- these three particular signs that he's given. I mean, anything that's uh, kind of thematically there or something that, you know, they would have seen that and said, you know, kind of like, oh, I get what's going you know, I mean, anything along those lines? Well, of course, the, the serpent thing is a big thing. Um, when we read it, we go back to the, you know, the garden in Genesis 3 and uh, and the serpent. Um, mm-hmm. And and serpents are, are, they're like universal symbols of all kinds of things. But the serpent was a big, that was the symbol of, of deity and power in Egypt. You know, Pharaoh wore that on his headpiece, um, and and you can you go to any any museum of antiquities, you can see this, uh, and so that uh, Moses' uh, staff, probably like a shepherd's staff, uh, becomes a serpent, um, and then is you know then is returned to the staff. Th- this is a this this is a particular signal to a people who are enculturated in Egypt that y- you're dealing you're dealing with deity here. You know, this is not just this is not just a a wizard. It's not just a magician. You're dealing with deity here. In fact, uh, that that gets amped up when um, the uh, you know, when God's serpent devours the Egyptian serpents, you know, they they do the the faux miracle. And it it, uh, and and so it. Um, the other one, the leper's hand, don't know what to make of that. I, you can play around with it if you want. You know, if Moses is a Christ figure, you know, that, that Christ takes on the leprosy of our sin and, mm-hmm. and, uh, and, and buries it in his, in his uh, not in his cloak, but in his grave and emerges victorious, uh, uh, you know, that, that kind of thing. Um, you know, maybe a little bit of a hint in there. Uh, certainly the, this kind of, this kind of, you know, here it is here. It's not kind of miracles going to, um, again, foreshadow the plagues, the boils and the plague that goes through Egypt. And, uh, also is going to impress on the people that you're dealing, you're dealing here with divine power that, uh, yeah, I I think so. And and I think that your, your point about, you know, really just kind of thinking about this in terms of Egypt makes a lot of sense. Um, because, you know, he's not going to Egyptians, but he is talking to people who have been living in Egypt for an awfully long time um, yeah. and are under the influence of the culture of Egypt. And so they get Egyptian stuff. Um, and I mean, and it's like and it's actually that the kind of fingerprints of that are really, I mean, in different places um, in Scripture, even just that uh, there is this way in which, I mean, the kind of Egyptian perspective and worldview is at least being responded to or is kind of informed the, the the kind of the categories that are being used in different places and uh well i mean even even the bit about i think it's interesting anyway that the ancient egyptians were some of the few people who practiced circumcision which um is another um thing that's going to be coming up uh, ju- in just a minute so i think yeah that you know it's it's unclear to me exactly how uh each one of those signs would have I mean, if it was like kind of like, I don't know, each one of these was kind of aimed at one of the three chief deities or something like that, or something along those lines. But I, I do think that, yeah, it, it does have kind of a, a very big kind of anti-Egyptian thrust there, well, um, I well, think sir- is, is safe to say. 
Certainly the first and the third. I, 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 I don't think that the, the, the leper's hand thing is necessary. Yeah, I mean, it certainly bespeaks divine power, but, but I don't think, I'm not sure it's, it's specifically Egyptian directed. The Nile certainly is. The Nile, the Nile itself is divine. The, the, you know, the Nile itself is the source of life. Uh, mm-hmm. And it's it's flooding banks as it renews the uh, the farmlands around the Nile. I mean, this is this is this is life for the Egyptians. And so, if the right. Nile is cut off, or if the Nile is poisoned, this is this is an absolute economic disaster. And uh, and so, um, I think it's interesting that Moses has to take that one on faith. He gets two, but not the third. There's almost like a proverbial. Yeah. There's a proverbial thing. Uh, you know, two witnesses establish something. And the problem oh, yeah. is always always pile on a third one to clinch it. You know, the third one is the one that clinches it. So he doesn't get the clincher. He has to he has to operate by faith too. See, and mm-hmm. and so he he's got to go to the people with two out of three in his pocket, and 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 uh, and God's <laughs> promise that he'll come through on the third one too. <laughs> That's right. He's going to try out the it's third good. one. He's like, I I sure hope this works because yeah, can I can I check I, that out? Make sure it works. Uh, no. Yeah, I know, I know, right? Go. Yeah, but just go. <laughs> uh, but but so yeah, so I mean, so thank you for that. So yeah, so he he goes with these signs, um, you know, having to you know have some faith um, himself, and he he actually. He takes the signs to them, and they're well received. Um, uh, now it's interesting. I mean, but that <clears throat> along the the path here, right? Um, he actually, I, I think we kind of skip over this. He actually he asks permission of his father-in-law, um, which is like the part of the story that we're just like, "What? You just been given a mission from God? Why are you? Why do you bother asking your father-in-law?" But I mean, it's kind of interesting because I think it kind of sets us up for this that. There, there is this like father son headship idea that is actually pretty important to the whole thing, um, and and I think the idea is that Moses has kind of been adopted as uh, the son. He's kind of adopted into this family on a certain level, um, and and so he's under this authority, right? And so like as much as he can, he's operating um, under these authorities. Um, and you know, good thing is that Jethro says yes. Uh, but but what's interesting, uh, uh, of course, besides this this line that we have here in verse 19, which is um, almost quoted in Matthew, right? Um, All the men who are seeking your life are dead. Right? Instead, in Matthew, referring to uh, our Lord. Well, that's good. I to, hadn't seen that. That's, that's that's true. <laughs> oh well, no, I mean like <laughs> it's you know it's it's actually it's really crazy. This in this thing, like just think about this here. Right, it actually says in this story here that he goes and he puts um, his wife and his sons on a donkey. Right, like it doesn't actually say that in the New Testament, but we all put the donkey there in the story. I think because these two two stories have been linked <laughs> together so traditionally by phrases like this. Yeah, and you know Moses had a bounty on his head because he killed an egyptian kind kind of like you know sort of yeah there, there's there's a there's a way to be god's man god's way and there's a way to be god's man your way and uh right. and and that moses way isn't going to work um and so uh but yeah there's a bounty on his head so apparently that's uh that's been lifted so he can go back to the land of egypt by the way you know i mean just we got to bear in mind they've been in Egypt for four hundred years. That I, that's more than just kind of picking up a few bad habits, okay? Oh, and yeah. so, so you know, I think God has a twofold task here: informing His people. He's got to wean them of the Egyptian way of life, and He's got to guard them against the Canaanite way of life because you know they're going mm-hmm. from pagan to pagan, and so the wilderness is kind of that 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 formation place and so but he's got to wean them first of of the egyptian tendencies uh which go right down to the golden calf but you can get to that some other yes. time that's an egyptian trick so they they know they have they have uh absorbed uh they they, they think like egyptians right and god has to well, make no, them so, into his people that's right and so and so it's really it's really key that like we said then that he's going to be going with this message with this name um, with with these signs, but before we even get there, we had to deal with the problem that that Moses had here, because because even though Moses is good and he's showing due deference to his father in law, there's this issue with his son, right? Because the message is, hey, your firstborn son, right? If you don't give me my firstborn son, there's this claim that God is making on the first on his firstborn, right? Um, but it seems that there's something going on with Moses's firstborn, and and it's just it, it's very alarming and people. People disagree about how it should be translated, but um, just kind of briefly, maybe without—we don't have time to go into all the details, but what do you think is the the kind of 
uh, the big takeaway from this little story here before Moses can even get there to Egypt. Um, what, what's going on here with Zipporah and his son? Yeah, well, yeah, there's, there's a ton of things going on here. So, so Moses has this uncircumcised son whose name we don't know, right? Hmm? And, and, uh, and, and this is like, you know, father not having his kids baptized or something. So, so, and his wife takes matters into her own hands and you know, kind of almost literally throws the foreskin at Moses' feet. This is this is a. I find it there's like deep irony here that here's a guy who's going to lead Israel. It's going to be God's leader, and he's not even he's not even proper head of his own household. And um, right. this is this is a total act of disrespect of dishonor on the part of Zipporah. Now here's something interesting, uh, you know. Look up Zipporah. You never hear from her again. Exodus 18. She's still she she's still at her father's house, and it says Moses mm. sent her away. So this was it. This is it. She's gone. Mm-hmm. Um, mm. so, so this is the end of that. This is the end of that marriage. And I guess her son went with her. Yeah. Moses, Moses is sprung free here. Uh, but but in a very I think dishonorable sort of way, and then there's a, there's kind of another twist too. See, it's the blood, the blood at his mm-hmm. feet. Um, you know, this is going to cost blood. Everything, everything, freedom it, is it costs in blood, the lamb's blood, and so this is really the blood of Moses' firstborn at his feet. Uh, before he wanders back to yeah. uh, Egypt to liberate God's firstborn, his his son no, that's Egypt, right. or his son and, Israel and from Egypt. And then it's really interesting to to ponder too. You know, is it like I don't I don't know what that Jethro and his family they didn't practice circumcision, and so Moses has been doing. Um, I don't know. He's like been showing undue deference actually, even to his father in law over and against. Um, God, I mean, those are sorts of questions we don't have explicit answers to, but just really, really briefly, there's like two, two minutes left here. But uh, so he, you know, you have this theme of, you know, are, are, is he actually going to obey God in, in these things, right? Or is he marching to uh, the beat of a different drum? And so he's going to the Israelites and saying, hey, look, here's the command. We're going to go do this. But I mean, is this, is he commanding them? Here's the question from the email. Is he commanding them to disobedience? Is this, is this civil disobedience? Like, hey, you know, Egypt says this, uh, Pharaoh says this, but it's time to revolt, right? I mean, or, or is this somehow that the Pharaoh's reign is illegitimate on a left-hand kingdom perspective? Yeah, that's that may be um, that may be laying a template on this. Got to be careful when when we lay like you know dogmatic templates on the scriptures. Um, sure, it's it's not actually. Um, Moses is going to Pharaoh, the head of government, and he's asking permission. Let yeah. these people go. They they they, yeah. they are. Um, it's by the command of God, and it's being reinforced with with signs of power from God. Um, and all the while, Pharaoh's heart is hardening, but um, it's 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 actually at no time it's disobedience. Even you know, Pharaoh kind of keeps saying, "Okay, get out of here, get out of here." You know, finally yeah. he really says, "Go." And yeah. uh, so, no, I would say absolutely not. This is this is yeah. God's direct intervention, and we dare not use uh, uh, well, biblical uh, things like that to uh, conjure up our own right. anarchy. <laughs> <laughs> well, and it and it's uh, yeah. I mean, just like you were saying, it's the paradox that somehow even in our Lord Jesus Christ obeying the government saves us with His blood. <laughs> to, Thank to you so death. much, brother. <laughs> yes, to His death. Thank yes. you so much, brother. Despite all the difficulties, God we bless. We did it. Hope to talk to you. Yeah, we did it. Talk to you real soon. All right, AJ. Everybody, that was Pastor William Swirla at Holy Trinity Lutheran Church in Hacienda Heights, California. Moving on to the next chapter in Exodus. Till then, everybody, I'm Pastor AJ Espinosa. Peace. make a gift safe, secure, and easily online at kfuo.org. Thank you for listening and supporting Thy Strong Word.